Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the Oli Foundation webinar during Feeding Tube Awareness Week, Patient Advocacy, How to Get Started. Generously sponsored by Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases. I'm Andrea Guidi, the Director of Educational Programs and Initiatives for the Oli Foundation, along with my colleague, Lisa Metzger, Editor of the Lifeline Letter and Director of Community Engagement, will be hosting this webinar today. Most of you are probably familiar with the Oli Foundation, but just in case this is your first experience, welcome. And I'd briefly like to introduce the organization to you. The Oli Foundation strives to enrich the lives of those who are living on home nutrition support, both intravenous, sometimes called HPN or TPN, and tube feeding. We do this through education, outreach, and networking. The Oli Foundation was founded in 1983 by Dr. Lynn Howard and her patient, Clarence Oli Oldenburg. Today, we serve approximately 25,000 plus members. All of our programs are free of charge to patients and their families. First, I'm gonna go over a few housekeeping details before we get into our programming. You should see a toolbar at the bottom of your screen. You can use this chat to chat uh, with both myself and Lisa Metzger in the chat function. In the Q&A function, please type any questions you have for our moderator, Nancy Pickett, or our speakers. Please note we are not responding to the hand raising function in the control panel. Please be sure and put your questions in the Q&A function rather than the chat. We just like to make it easier for our speakers to follow along with the questions and make sure that your questions don't get lost in our chat function. We'll answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A period of the presentations. To note, the live transcription is on. If you'd like to hide or show your closed captions, please see the live transcription um, icon at the bottom of your screen. We'll post a recording of the presentation after the webinar on the OLI website. And please note that we've muted all our participants, so you don't need to worry if there's background noise, like a dog barking, uh, where you're taking this webinar. If you're having any technical issues, please go to the Oli, or the Zoom website and the address on your screen. We have a few additional details I'd like to share with you. From 2 to 2.30, we will host the advocacy workshop portion of our program. This workshop is hosted on the Zoom meeting platform rather than the webinar platform we're on right now. That link to join the webinar was, or the workshop was provided in your reminder emails. But if you can't find it and you'd still like to join, don't worry. Uh, Lisa has posted the link in the chat section. Um, and you can also find the link on the Oli website. If you just head over to our website and go to our community enrichment page, at the top where it says upcoming event, events, if you scroll down to this webinar, you'll see um, a, little, a little join workshop button. If you just click on that, it'll take you right into the meeting. And we'll share this link with you again around two o'clock at the end of our webinar. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our editor and community and rich engagement director, Lisa Metzger. Hi, everybody. We're so glad you're able to join us today. Um, we've got, uh, I think, a great lineup uh, with Betty Marie and, well, start with Beth. Beth's going to go first and Betty Marie and then Dale Dirks. Um, and Nancy Pickett has joined us. Nancy will be doing the, um, is the moderator for today's session. And we'll be doing the Q&A at, the, at the end of the hour, about quarter of. Um, I just want to say that it is the director of community engagement. It's a real honor and, and privilege to be able to work with our volunteers and uh, to coordinate some of the advocacy efforts that Oli does. So if you ever want to reach out about any of those things, please give us a call and you can email me or um, any of us. We can all answer questions. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Nancy Pickett. Uh, Nancy is an Oli ambassador. She uh, joined within the last couple of years as an ambassador. She says that she's been benefited tremendously from connecting with other, pa other patients who've helped her navigate life with a feeding tube in Central Line, which motivated her to become an only ambassador and to volunteer to help others. Nancy was diagnosed with GI dysmotility in 2015 and has experience with both enteral and parenteral nutrition, so tube feeding and IV nutrition. Um, 
Nancy has experience advocating for medical needs in public school, living on a college campus, moving cross country, and transitioning between doctors while on home parental nutrition. She is currently studying online at the University of Florida, pursuing a master's degree in public interest communication. Nancy's done a couple of interviews, or sorry, a couple of webinars with us on our during past um, awareness weeks. This, this week is Feeding Tube Awareness Week. Nancy did interviews last year on Feeding Tube Awareness Week and HPN Awareness Week with uh, other consumers. So those recordings are on our website and they're quite good and worth, worth finding. Um, back to my, my the bio, uh, Nancy created her first feature length film, a documentary about pediatric cancer in high school. And she did a short film about the Affordable Care Act, which has been recognized by film festivals across the country, including the News and Documentary Emmy Awards. She's currently working on a film that will just, and Nancy, I'm, I don't know if this is still exactly how you describe it, but you can correct me. Um, her next film will explore disparities in healthcare among different demographic groups. So we're, we're very honored and pleased to have you here with us, Nancy, and we look Thank forward to this. Yeah. Yeah, I'm so excited to be here and a part of a webinar about such an important topic that I'm so passionate about, um, patient advocacy, and it's my pleasure to be able to introduce Beth Gore. Beth is a national patient advocate focused on vascular access and intestinal failure. She's worked in several healthcare and nonprofit spaces, including the Joint Commission, FDA, NIH, National Health Council, Vanguard, Aspen, and she's currently serving as the president of our very own Foley Foundation. On top of her advocacy work, she's a mother to six children with special needs, and she's here to share with us about how you can use your voice to advocate in healthcare spaces. Thanks, Nancy. It's an honor to be here today. Thanks for, for inviting me. So I'll start with a story. I live in Florida, right? So when I was about three years old, my parents took me to Disney World. Where else would you go, right? And they bought my sister and me this Pooh Bear, this Winnie the Pooh Bear. And that was popular at the time. Well, fast forward and this thing became my only stuffy, lovey, plushy, whatever you want to call this thing. And I took it everywhere and I loved it to death. Like, I mean, like I rubbed the fur off the thing and it started losing its mouth, its nose, all these things. In the meantime, my sister sat on a shelf and was perfect, right? So in case you don't um, believe me, I actually have my Pooh Bear here. See, a, it's not even recognizable as a Pooh Bear anymore. And I, um, I'll come back to this as to why that's important, but um, the really quick version, like she said, like Nancy just said, as I have six children, they're all adopted with special needs. And the youngest one is the one that uh, really got me to, to the Oli Foundation, Manny. At the age of two, he was already struggling. He should have already been on um, tube feeds earlier. <clears throat> But it's, uh, it, it, it took a while for him to get onto that. And then eventually he needed to go to uh, total parenteral nutrition when at home. And then I, over the last few years, have also had some struggles myself uh, with, with digestive issues. So I can tell you as a mo mother of somebody who it's difficult. I can tell you it has been a thousand times, at least for me, more difficult to advocate for myself than for my own child. And I'm not going to go into a lot of that today, but if you're finding like I can advocate for somebody else easier than for myself, you're not alone. So to me, advocacy is about being a voice and using our voice correctly. In fact, I wear an, a bracelet almost all the time, and I know you can't see it, but it says, be a voice. And so whether it's to an individual clinician for myself or my loved one, or it's on a national basis calling for change, I think advocacy in a nutshell is being a voice. And to me, the key is we have to use a voice so it can be heard and it's something of value to say. And so I'm going to explore that a little bit now. So just a philosophy. I believe that we all have pieces of a puzzle. Clinicians also have pieces of, of a puzzle. So the question is, how do we put that together? Um, or it's Congress may have pieces of a puzzle. How do we put those pieces together? And uh, so I think it's not about pushing our own treatment. So a lot of times I hear somebody say, I'm a patient advocate. That means I do what I want and I tell them how it's going to be. Uh, maybe. I don't know that that's exactly pushing our agenda or pushing our treatment. I think it's about being collaborative. So when say something like a clinician says something like I might ask, why is that your suggested medicine or treatment or test? Or what are you hoping to learn by that test? Basically, I want to participate in all the areas of my loved one's plan of therapy and realize not all patients want to do that. In fact, 
I believe it's fairly rare. So clinicians are used to driving the bus. And when we say, hey, we would like to share some of the driving with you, it's not ex extremely common for them as well. So we have to realize that. For long-termers, um, sometimes our goal isn't just treatment, it's also management long-term. And I think this also is another huge uh, shift for clinicians. So everyone has to keep the big picture in mind, and that's not necessarily what they do. A lot of clinicians are very episodic in their thinking, and we have to sort of uh, expand their horizons a little bit. So for example, I think one of the best questions that a doctor or patient can ask is, what's your goal? What are we looking for here? For example, when Manny was really little, he was starting to drown in his own secretions from the tube feedings. It's a long story, won't go into the details, but I remember going into the doctor, telling them my goal is for my child to stop saying, help me, I can't breathe. And she started to realize the depth of the help that I needed wasn't just tweaking a little formula or speeding it up two degrees or down two centimeters or whatever it was. Like it wasn't just that little bit. Um, so, or another example is what's your goal? Like I know a grandfather who was quite ill, but he was quite old. And the doctor was able to ask this question, what is your goal? Because see, the guy didn't want him to cure old age. He, he wanted his goal to be healthy enough to watch his first grandchild graduate college six months later. I mean, I think that's something the doctor said, oh, that, okay, now we know what we're working towards. So when we have these complex chronic diseases like many of us have, I think this is an extremely important way to start thinking about the way we advocate for ourselves or our loves. Like for example, I just kind of uh, completed a National Health Council task force project where we worked for almost two years on the patient journey mapping. And I was the sole lone voice on that to let clinicians know there's a huge shift in our journey when we start moving to want to participate in our care. And that's starts to begin to build the team that we want to partner with. So I also wanted to keep teams to say, hey, it's Beth and Manny, not, oh no, it's Beth and Manny. And to me, that was one of the goals I had in my head when I wanted to start to personally advocate for my child. And I just want to say really quickly, a personal advocacy pitfall, I think sometimes we come across as overbearing in what we ask for or how we ask. And while I don't think we need to shy away or back off, I think we need to have some self-awareness of, is that how we're coming across? Now, trust me, there are times where you have to, but if we can prevent that as many times as possible in the long run, I think we're going to get further along. I think when we start to get overbearing, at least for me, I feel like I'm not getting heard. I start feeling desperate. And at that point, I think I might start uh, doing bad behavior. I might start getting a label as, oh, that's that mother bear over there. And I realized, could I avoid that next time? Because I'm still not getting what I need. So let's talk about it like acute versus chronic real quick. So acute, I think it's relatively easy to advocate for yourself or a loved one. For example, here's a formula I'm gonna use. I think there's, what is the symptom? What is the severity? And what is the impact on your life? Even then there's some pitfalls. Like for example, uh, my dad was sick over the last few, uh, few weeks. He kept telling his doctors he was tired and they're all like, well, you're 75. Of course you're tired. So when he started honing in on, well, I'm actually, I'm short of breath. They started going, ah, aha, I, that led to tests, which re led to results, which led to a needed heart surgery. The word tired wasn't getting what he needed. The word short of breath triggered something. When we're, when we're chronic, we're complicated by this time. And I, like, I had these GI issues that I was mentioning. I was trying to avoid like the term drug seeking label. <laughs> so they, I assumed that if I didn't go in there saying, hey, I need pain meds, I need pain meds, that they would not put me in that category. What I found was I got in the other category. Well, if you don't need pain meds, it can't be that bad. Oh. So clearly it's not an easy thing to advocate, right? So let's talk about this really quickly about, we still need to focus on severity 
symptom severity and impact on life. For example, I find most clinicians can handle one symptom at a time. Good ones can probably handle up to three. And if you've ever found unicorns or experts that they can see the big picture, hold on to them. Those are important. For example, like the symptom, my kid has an ear infection is probably not the best way to handle that. They're going to feel threatened. I don't know why, but they will. The, uh, an okay way to say that is my kid has pain in his ear. So I shared the symptom. A better one would be my kid has pain in his ear symptom that's causing him to cry or whatever severity and can't sleep or eat for the last two days. And it shows impact on life. Do you see how more specific that is? I'm more likely to get my needs met that way. Then they prescribe the antibiotics and they recovered or they won't, you know, it's the, the, the desired outcome. But with long-term and chronic, we have to do that same thing but we have to do it across time. And it takes a lot of preparation. I spend an inordinate amount of time working ahead of time before I even go into a doctor's office. Just Monday, this week, for example, we had a GI appointment with my son, Manny, uh, who's on HPN. I overly prepare. I ask myself these questions. What symptoms has he been having? What severity has that had to what severity and what impact is that having on my life? And I think through all of those, and then I hone down to what are the most important one, two that I want to get across today. And then finally, what is it that I would like the doctor or clinician to do? And if I have that clearly in my head, I'm likely to be able to articulate my needs and I'm likely to walk away with what I need. So really I'm having to synthesize what's a priority, what's important to me, what do I need to leave with um, and start talking about basically quality of life. Um, and we won't always agree with our team and that's okay. But if we've built a team of collaborators and each one respect each other, I respect them, they respect my perspective. We focus on the big picture. We can often advocate to be there. So like today, back to Pooh Bear, <clears throat> he's been well-worn. He's been through a lot, just like me. That's why he, I, I identify so well with him. I feel like this sometimes as an advocate, I feel like I've gotten beat up. Obviously he was well-loved over the years, but he serves as a reminder that we're not going to get it right every time. We're not. And we get to keep trying. We have to stay focused. We have to be a voice that can be heard and that has something of value to say. And finally, we try not to do it alone. You don't have to advocate alone. We're not out there in a wilderness being the only person. So build your puzzle pieces. And just like Oli's vision, we say this often, you see it everywhere on Oli's things. Look for and find, and you shall find it, help along the way. Good luck in your advocacy. Thank you so much, Beth. That was great. I mean, as somebody who has a chronic illness, I also really struggle with preparing for appointments and trying to figure out what to say and how to get it across the right way. And you have this very simple formula that makes it so much like less daunting to think about, I think. And I love what you said about self-awareness and keeping track of ourselves and our word choices we advocate. And this actually translates really well into our next presentation because Betty Marie uses her personal experience with home parental nutrition to advocate not only for her own health care, but also on Capitol Hill and within patient organizations. She's been an OLE ambassador since 1992, and she's also worked with the Muscular Dystrophy Association, United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation, and the Digestive Disease National Coalition, which you'll hear more about later in our webinar. Betty's the first person on HPN to serve as a member of the American Society for Parental and Enteral Nutrition, otherwise known as ASPEN, um, public policy committee, and she's here with us today to talk to you about using your story to advocate for the digestive disease community. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Nancy. Beth, that was awesome. Uh, she gave great advice. We could hold this session just on working on those principles alone. I'm trying to figure out, there we go. I'm excited to be here today, speaking with all of you about advocacy. I hope to inspire you to use your voice to advocate for issues important to you and the home pen community. You may be wondering, 
What is advocacy and why should I advocate? Beth spoke a lot about advocating within the medical realm. And I'm gonna to touch on that just a tiny bit, but I'm gonna go into some other forms of advocacy as well. Simply advocacy is to change what is into what should be. Let's start by thinking of what is. What is frustrating to you? And what do you wish was is less problematic? And so we're gonna do a quick poll here. I think Andrea was gonna put in a poll question. So read through and you can mark off more than one choice if you'd like. What may be most frustrating to you? And you can scroll up because there's more um, to see. And then I hope within the chat that you actually elaborate a little bit about some of the frustrations that you face. So we'll just give it another few seconds for it to gather everybody's responses. And just while we're doing that, in the chat, if you'd like to comment about some issues that you faced with the insurance, I know we all could list probably a thousand, any supply issues that you've had. I know many of us have been facing some national shortages, both on the tube feeding side and on the IV nutrition side. It looks, and many of us, go ahead, sorry. That's okay, Betty, I, I don't mean to interrupt. It looks like we have everybody participating. I'll give it 10 more seconds and then we can close the poll. Perfect. All righty, let's end the poll. And these are our results. Wow, so look at that, a lot of, with insurance, people are, are experiencing issues with supplies, with shortages, the lack of awareness, having to educate medical professionals. You know, when we have something that's rare, that can be very challenging for us to find medical professionals that are skilled and knowledgeable. And we often have to do a lot of the educating. Often with treatment, I know many of us, it's just managing symptoms because there is no medication for us to take. And then that also leads into limited research as well. And as Beth mentioned, I know that um, many of us can relate to being in the hospital and seeing something that's concerning and wondering, what should I do? How do I speak up? Well, that is exactly what led me into beginning to use my voice. At first, I did not speak up for myself to nurses or doctors because I was more concerned about hurting their feelings. And as a result, I suffered. After experiencing life-threatening complications because a medical professional used poor technique, I learned that I must speak up to protect my line and my life. Over time, I became more effective within speaking up within the moment, but I thought medical professionals should be already trained. So my adventure with advocacy grew. I began to give presentations to medical professionals to increase awareness. If this is something that you might be interested in doing, reach out to Oli for some guidance. This is an example of acting on what is and then using my voice to encourage change to what should be. A few years later, in the Lifeline letter, Oli asked if anybody would be interested in going to Capitol Hill to talk to politicians about having a digestive disease and being on home pen. Well, just as you may be thinking, 
I thought the same. Well, why should I advocate legislatively? I should leave that to somebody else. But then I thought, doctors told me a long time ago that there was nothing more that they could do for me, that this is the way my life would be, in pain and on TPN. They said, have hope though, because new medications are always coming out. Maybe in 20 years, a new medication will come out. And I have to say that after reading that article in the Lifeline letter about going to DDNC, all of a sudden I realized that it was 20 years later and things were still exactly the same. No medications and no treatments. That's what inspired me to do DDNC to advocate for research and also for better insurance coverage. So that's an example of taking what it is and focusing on what it should be and acting upon it. Here's a photo of my first attendance with DDNC. I was very nervous that day, but I told my story. I paired my experience on home pen with the DDNC legislative priority as Dale taught. The priority ask was for increased funding for NIH. Months later, it was very rewarding to hear that funding for the NIH was increased. You will be amazed at how easy it can be to advocate once you start. I encourage you to join and to participate in DDNC this year. What's great about participating is they schedule the meetings, Dale goes over the legislative priorities, and he teaches how to conduct congressional meetings. And here's some photos from some meetings over the years. What's wonderful about right now is that you can actually advocate legislatively from the very comfort of your own home, right from your sofa. This is the virtual DDNC meeting last year with Congressman Brian Fitzpatrick. He's down in the lower corner. And actually, um, there's quite a few OLE members in on this call. And that's what's wonderful about this time right now is meetings are being conducted virtually, which opens it up to a lot more OLE members who travel is very difficult for. So really think about um, making the most of this opportunity right now. And then hopefully Congress will see how beneficial it is and they'll continue having meetings in this format for the future. Because we really need your help. Advocating for what you believe in is crucial. If you don't ask for it, people assume you don't need it. I really learned this going down and talking to politicians. And yes, DC is based upon a numbers game and often the loudest and the most is heard. But if you think about it, it's common sense. If the politicians don't know what home pen is and they don't know what issues we face with digestive diseases, then how can they begin to even put forth legislation to help us? Therefore, it is vital that you take time to share your experiences because unless you do, they have absolutely no idea about our needs and they focus on other issues. No one is better at educating legislatures than you are. Your story matters and your voice is important. You can encourage change. A big part of the process is developing relationships with the staff and the politicians. Not just one time, but developing it over time. And yes, it does take time for legislative change to happen. Just like how a snowball, what we need to do is we need to build up the momentum and the awareness. And then gradually, we'll see the change happen. Try to think outside the box to increase awareness as well. Here's an example of what I did. For Home Pen Awareness Week last October, I taught Congressman Brian Fitzpatrick how to set up TPN. And this is all mock stuff, um, but 
my home infusion company provided. I needed to be very careful because I didn't want to overcorrect him and I didn't want to list off all of the scary risks. I didn't want to scare him. My goal was to get him to support home infusions, for him to see that somebody without experience can learn how to set up an IV to infuse it at home. I also wanted to teach him about it. So this way, when I talk to him about TPN, he has an experience in his mind that he can picture. I hope I'm inspiring you to say yes. I want to advocate. So now you may be wondering, now what? So this is where you want to start to think of, well, what are some of the should be's and what change would you want to encourage? For that, you want to reach out and you can let Oli know because Oli can help provide some guidance with that. And then Andrea has a second poll question that we'll take a look at. Take a look at what types of advocacy you might be interested in participating in. Raising awareness through social media or local news outlets, contacting politicians, participating in FDA meetings, talking with medical students, talking to companies that make the medical devices that we use, talking to home care companies, participating in continuing ed classes, helping other home pen consumers, participating on day on the hill events, whether you're with DDNC or rare diseases or other organizations, or just being a guest speaker at a medical seminar or at a hospital. And so we we'll give that a few seconds for it to collaborate. The results. And it really does, it just begins with just starting to use your voice. Something so simple. We'll give everybody a few more seconds to share your, share your answers and then we'll close the poll. All righty, let's end the poll now. Oh, that's wonderful. It really looks like there's some interest all around. And um, we could always talk a little bit more later on how to begin to talk with medical students, how to become a guest speaker at a local hospital maybe in the question and answer, that would be a great time to bring some of that up. And for the other one that seemed like a few people were interested, I really hope to encourage you to sign up for DDNC this year and maybe we'll have a record number of only members in attendance. And this will lead us perfectly into Dale's discussion. Afterwards, stick around. Um, there will be that separate link to join in on a group activity to work on how to develop an elevator pitch. And I'm going to pass it back to Nancy. Thanks, Betty. I really loved hearing about your journey into advocacy, and I saw so many similarities with this in my own life. I can't tell you how many times I've gone to the hospital and thought, Okay, well, guess I'm just, you know, not going to eat for the next day or two until they can get my TPN sorted out or, you know, open up my TPN boxes and think, oh, must be another national shortage. And I'm sure so many people can relate. I see it in the chat. And I think it's easy to feel like there's nothing that we can do for some of these issues as patients, especially for those of us who have really debilitating physical symptoms with no cure. And 
might not be able to do everything that we want to do. But you're a great example of somebody who's been able to make it work. And you're right that as more opportunities come up to advocate virtually and from home, I think more people will be able to get involved. And our next presenter is the perfect person to tell us how to do that. Dale Dirks has worked for nearly 40 years as the Washington representative for many voluntary health organizations, scientific organizations, and medical societies, including the Digestive Disease National Coalition um, that Betty was talking about. And Oli is also a part of that. He advocates for public health interest, medical research, and patient access issues like the Safe Step Act. He's here with us today to speak about how to get involved with government advocacy. So I'm gonna give it over to Dale. Thank you, Nancy. And uh, I, I want to uh, know if everyone can hear me okay. Uh, and then also, I, I think I have some slides that someone was going to put up. Uh, Dale, we can hear you, but we can't see you. Yes, I, you know, I have been trying to get my camera working all day. I've been on about six Zoom calls all, uh, all day today. And for some reason, my camera is not working. So I apologize. Uh, for not being able to be on camera. My, you know, my mom always told me that I had a face for radio uh, anyway, but. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. I can share your, your slides for you. Okay. I, and I, you know, I'm really, I'm really sorry that I can't be on camera. I just haven't been able to figure it out. I'm sure it's some easy technical thing, but if you can put up my slides, I'll go ahead and get started with my presentation. Uh, first off, you know, I wanted to uh, thank you uh, for inviting me to, to join uh, the discussion today. And I will just say to you that um, it was very gratifying to hear the nice words from Betty Marie uh, about the DDNC and her involvement. And I can just tell you that um, we look forward to the Digestive Disease uh, National Coalition's Public Policy Forum every year. And honestly, one of the highlights um, of that event on an annual basis is uh, the involvement of people like Betty Marie. She's the embodiment of uh, an advocate. You know, I understand and appreciate that it's not easy uh, for folks uh, that are struggling to travel to Washington. Somehow every year she manages to do it and she does it with great aplomb. So I, um, uh, my hat's off uh, to Betty Marie and the rest of the advocates that participate in the public policy forum for the DDNC. Uh, you know, um, the organization has been around since 1978, and I can't think of a year that we haven't had some involvement from uh, representatives from the Oli Foundation. Joan Bishop has been um, a representative to the board of directors uh, on the DDNC uh, for decades, and uh, more recently, Lisa Metzger. Uh, has taken the opportunity to not only serve on the board, but she's also serving on the executive committee of the organization and the public policy committee. And that's uh, uh, the uh, participation in the public policy committee is a really a key thing because she helps uh, steer the organization's uh, legislative priorities on an annual basis. And I'll tell you a little bit more about them in, in just a second, but I'll just say that the, the Oli Foundation's participation in the DDNC has really been critical over these last several decades. And um, uh, not only does the organization send um, terrific representatives to participate in the activities of the board and the executive committee, but on an annual basis, led by B Betty Marie, uh, there are tremendous and terrific advocates that are participating in the public policy forum. I wanna tell you just a little bit about the organization. And if you could uh, go to the next slide. Uh, the, the organization was started in uh, 1978. And uh, I, I suppose I'm dating myself a little bit, but I've been worth working with the Digestive Disease National Coalition since 1982. But the organization was started um, uh, when there was a national commission in the late 1970s on digestive disease research, the question was being asked on a federal level, how should we restructure the um, digestive disease research portfolio at the National Institutes of Health? And representatives from organizations like the Oli Foundation, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, the American Gastroenterological Association, the doctors groups as well, participated in that national commission. The national commission made any number of recommendations 
um, uh, about the structure of the research program at the National Institutes of Health. And at the conclusion of the commission, the leaders of those organizations uh, uh, coalesced and said, you know something, if we are going to advocate for the implementation of the recommendations of this national commission, we should be speaking with one voice. So patient organizations and provider groups coalesce to speak um, uh, on behalf of the di digestive disease community. And the first big victory was to uh, implement the recommendations of that national commission from the late 1970s. And the structure that you see at the National Institutes of Health um, uh, today uh, uh, represents the recommendations made by that national commission and implemented uh, at the behest of Congress as a result of the Digestive Disease National Coalition's advocacy. Betty Marie made the point that uh, sometimes it takes a while to get something done from a legislative and policy standpoint and uh, 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 more truthful words, words have never been spoken. It's really critical to have a sustained effort. Currently we have uh, 50 uh, organizations, patient uh, organizations, professional societies, doctors and nurses and industry leaders in the DDNC. And um, I would uh, venture to say that the DDNC is among the uh, leading organizations on a national level speaking on behalf of digestive diseases. And uh, the slide, uh, the, the, the visual you see there is our uh, former president, Dr. Samir Shah along with our volunteer um, uh, chairperson, Nancy Ginter, along with the director uh, of the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases, Dr. Griffin Rogers, and also Congressman Jamie Raskin, uh, a colon cancer survivor, um, receiving the D Digestive Disease National Coalition's Public Policy Leadership Award. Um, I will just tell you that the reason um, patient both patient-based organizations and professional societies value that um, uh, membership in the DDNC is because of the patient involvement. You know, when doctors go to Capitol Hill, their involvement is important and they bring a lot of expertise. The combination of healthcare professionals and patients going to talk with legislators about the importance of digestive diseases is a perfect combination. It's described by the doctor groups as the secret sauce that gives helps give them credibility because patients have what they call a pure self-interest. They want to be healthier and they want to get better. Let's go to the next slide. Um, the uh, typically the organization and and uh, that's me at the podium by the way, uh, speaking to uh, a group of uh, individuals who are attending the public policy forum, but. Um, we concentrate our efforts in three areas historically, uh, the Digestive Disease National Coalition. The first is in research, and I described our advocacy for the structure and funding on an annual basis for the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases at NIH. We also spend a lot of time on patient access issues, and in fact, um, as more treatments uh, have become available over the last several years for any number of uh, digestive uh, conditions, uh, we've spent more time uh, focusing on making sure that patients have access uh, to those treatments. And then the third thing that we uh, focus on is public health issues. Uh, there are a variety of programs that, uh, for example, the Centers for Disease Control that concentrate and focus on colon cancer screening, uh, viral hepatitis, inflammatory bowel disease, and other chronic health care conditions that we advocate for. This year um, at the Public Policy Forum, we're going to be advocating for all of those uh, topics, but we're also going to be focusing on the Safe Step Act. And uh, I don't know how familiar you are with the Safe Step Act, but the, you probably have heard the term step therapy, and that's when a um, insurer um, forces a patient to uh, go to the medication or treatment that is their preferred treatment and not that of the healthcare professional and the patient. And that individual has to fail first on that uh, uh, treatment 
before they can go to the treatment or medication or um, that is uh, preferred by the doctor. And uh, uh, the Safe Step Act would put guardrails on the practice of, safe, of step therapy that is implemented by third-party payers and uh, assure a swift appeals process if the patient and the healthcare provider feel like the decision made by the third-party payer or the insurance company is inappropriate and uh, the, the swift appeals process would enable the healthcare provider and the patient to appeal and get that individual back on the right treatment. Um, uh, as Betty Marie uh, said, we're coming up uh, on March uh, 6th and 8th uh, on the uh, uh, 32nd annual public policy forum. This year's event is going uh, to be virtual. And uh, as Betty Marie pointed out, uh, uh, a lot of individuals that are um, uh, suffering from uh, critical health healthcare conditions and can't travel, um, many of them, many more of them can participate. And we enthusiast enthusiastically welcome your participation in the public policy forum. You can easily register by going to ddnc.org and clicking on the registration button. Uh, you can participate in any of the virtual events that start on Sunday, uh, March 6th, uh, and then uh, all throughout the week, uh, that uh, coming week, our teams uh, from states uh, and uh, uh, local jurisdictions will be meeting with their members of Congress to talk about the importance of research, the Safe Step Act, and these public health issues. Most important thing that we can do during the public policy forum is educate legislators about digestive diseases. They don't know very much about uh, parenteral and enteral nutrition. They don't know very much about feeding tubes. They don't know but very much about inflammatory bowel disease or other digestive health conditions. It's our job to educate them. And uh, if uh, they are predisposed to helping us as a result of that education, We've got any, any number of things that they can do to support our efforts. And I also think it's really important to utilize the opportunity to uh, interface with these legislators to start to build an ongoing relationship with them. You know, um, let's go to the next slide, if you don't mind. Um, uh, uh, it, the, the point about um, uh, Nothing happens overnight, especially um, in Washington and uh, in the legislative and uh, policy agenda. Nothing happens overnight, but it's sustained, a sustained effort. So and one of the things that I know that individuals do uh, during the DDNC public policy forum is take the opportunity to start that relationship with your local legislator, educate them about your healthcare condition and digestive diseases, and um, periodically, uh, keep in touch with them and they make decisions 12 months out of the year. So it's really important at the right time to be in touch with them. And organizations like the Orley Foundation and the DDNC are happy to keep you informed about these key and critical issues that are coming up that you can weigh in with your legislators on. But it's important to start that relationship and it's important to maintain that relationship. And I've been doing this for about 40 years. In fact, I just celebrated. In my, the conclusion of my 40th year. And people are skeptical, skeptical about Washington, especially when they read the news and some of the crazy things that happen in Washington. But to a person, uh, most legislators, I think, they really want to hear from their constituents. They want to know what's on their mind and they want to act in their best interest. Um, they can only do that if you are talking with them and telling them your story. Uh, Betty Marie makes the point about uh, the interface with Brian Fitzpatrick. He didn't know anything about that before Betty Marie told him, and now he knows. And in his decision-making process, he's got that in mind. So I think that's really important. Um, the other thing is that you, know, you have to keep in mind that uh, the legislators, they, they work for us. And um, uh, we should have an expectation that they are going to listen uh, to what you have to say and take action in a positive way on your behalf. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, um, so advocates educate, 
educate, educate. They use their own story to raise awareness. I always tell people that, you know, when you're in Washington uh, and you're coming in and talking with your legislators and you've got a little script and everything like that, you don't have to be an expert on the legislative process. You don't have to be an expert on what the bill numbers are or what percentage of an increase we're asking for, for uh, the National Institutes of Health or one of the programs at CDC. You know, you're an expert on your story and uh, it's really important to um, focus on that. Use your story to raise awareness about digestive diseases and most legislators or their staff will come to the conclusion uh, that they want to help you. And we've got certainly got a list and that's all down on paper. So you don't have to memorize any of that stuff. And you're an expert on your story. So you can tell people about that um, pretty easily. Um, it's really important to make local connections. If you have a chapter or a support group uh, in your community, um, it's uh, the legislators le like to hear from uh, one uh, of their constituents, but they really love to hear from 10. So it's really very important. And the other thing is, you know, we, we do ask for specific uh, actions from legislators. So when we talk with legislators during the public policy forum, we're going to be educating them about digestive diseases, but we're also going to be asking them to pass the Safe Step Act, increase funding for digestive disease for research at National Institutes of Health, support these public health programs on digestive diseases. Okay, I think that's the conclusion of my slides. And um, uh, I really wanna thank everyone uh, for uh, listening to the presentation. I'm very pleased to join with my panelists in responding to any observations or questions. And um, I'm really thrilled uh, to, to be asked to join you. And we would be, the Digestive Disease National Coalition would be equally thrilled uh, to have any number of you register and participate in the public policy forum. It'd be a great experience. And um, uh, you don't just have to take my word for it, just take Betty Marie's word for it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jill. That was amazing. I've been following the Safe Step Act, and I know a lot of us here have. It's important for everybody who's managing chronic and complex conditions. Um, and I think there's a lot of people who are really interested and learning more and joining you in March. So we are gonna jump right into the Q&A. We have a few questions already submitted. Uh, the rest of you can feel free to submit your question in the Q&A toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Uh, just a reminder that we're not gonna be using the raised hand features. Uh, we can't see them. And sometimes your questions can get lost in the chat. So I've seen a few of them in there, but it's really best to use that Q&A feature if you can. Um, I think our first question is going to go over to Beth, which is what inspired you to start advocating? Mm, need. Need started it. Uh, so really the, the, the bottom line for me is that my child, I had five other children before we even adopted Manny, who is a lot more complex than the rest of them. And I didn't realize just how different that would be. And along the way, I started asking more and more questions. I'll tell a really quick story is when I, when my now 18 year old was, uh, we, we got him at two days old from the hospital and we were told that he had a hole in his heart, but we weren't told what. And I was talking to my brother-in-law who was a doctor of radiology at the time. And he says, what do you mean? You don't know what type of hole it is. What do you mean? You don't know the size and all this. And I'm like, I can, I can have that information because I think like a lot of patients, you think, oh, the doctors will give me everything that I need. So fast forward and my mother-in-law gets pancreatic cancer and she doesn't ask any questions. And I think that's very typical. Like I say, I have a problem. The next person gives me the medicine. I swallow the medicine and I get on with my life. But if it's not like that, it gets complex. We need to start advocating. And so I saw my child falling through the cracks, uh, metaphorically speaking, um, harm was starting to happen. And I'm like, I'm his mother. I should do better. And it, it was born out of need of how do I do this? How do I get heard? Who, who can help me? And I started looking around for everyone. So I started with my own son. I started going with my own family. We started local at local hospitals. And I ended up on doing now what I do is almost exclusively national advocacy um, on behalf, behalf of patients. So it started out of need. Yes, I'm seeing in the chat. Yes, need indeed. I think that we all understand that living with um, these complex conditions. 
Um, this question is going to Dale. Um, after we register for the public policy forum, what happens next? What role will we be playing and how will we know what that is? Right. Thank you. Um, uh, if you register for the public policy forum, they'll, um, the, some of the registration information ask for your background, whether you're a patient or an advocate or a healthcare professional, uh, where you're from geographically, uh, you know, if you have any uh, specific interest and if uh, you would be willing to make congressional visits, part of the public policy forum is educational uh, for people who are attending. We get presentations from federal officials, legislators, um, and advocates on uh, uh, typical issues, but it also asks if a person would like to participate in, um, uh, in the advocacy activities uh, throughout the week. Uh, once we identify how you will participate, uh, we'll kind of triage your activities, but we want to have the expectation that people will participate in the educational um, activities on Sunday, to get up to speed on the issues, and then they will be assigned to a team, uh, primarily of individuals from your states, and your team might consist of other people who are involved with the Oli Foundation. There may, it may be a gastroenterologist or a, a, a GI nurse on your team. There might be someone with inflammatory bowel disease, there might be someone with uh, viral hepatitis on your team from your state. Um, and uh, our office will set up uh, meetings for that team and you will be briefed on the issues and you'll have all the information that you'll need to have an effective discussion with your legislator, educate them about digestive diseases and then make these uh, specific asks. And what we found last year uh, historically, you know, the, the public policy forum has been a live event. People come to Washington. We fan out on Capitol Hill to talk with the legislators in in-person meetings. Last year, and of course this year, we're doing it as a, a virtual event. So we put up more time in up front. Once we set the teams, typically we'll have a Zoom call uh, with each of the teams a week in advance of the public policy forum so the team members can get acquainted with each other understand um, how uh, each of uh, their teammates are impacted by various digestive diseases, and then kind of work out who's going to say what and how you're going to conduct your meetings. And I think that was really helpful to individuals who were participating last year. Um, so by the time the public policy forum rolls around, you will know your teammates uh, from your state. And that's, and that's actually a pretty good exercise anyway, because you want to know people in your community who are impacted by di digestive diseases anyway, and you might be people that just live right down the street. Um, but you'll, you'll know who your teammates are. Your team will have a plan for making your visits. You'll know what the key issues are and what the key recommendations and asks are. By the time the public policy forum rolls around, you'll have your schedule, know how your teammates are going to interact on that schedule and uh, who's gonna say what and how to follow up. Awesome, thank you. And I did uh, put the link to register in the chat. I think I saw somebody ask for it. Yes, thank um, you. And it sounds like you guys have a really great setup where people who have no experience can really kind of come in and uh, just hit the ground running. And with that, I wanna send the next question over to Betty with your experience. Um, I know that you were uh, really involved in the Home Infusion Site of Care Act, and I think that uh, we'd all be a little interested to hear um, more about that and how you how you helped and what it did. Hi. Yes, that um, I ended up creating a petition that gathered over eighty thousand signatures, and I presented the petition to various offices. It ended up that that actual bill didn't get passed, but part of it was included in the CARES Act that was passed. And um, that was one of the, a lot of times with some of these bills, it's little steps. And so that was one of the first steps to trying to get saline covered for in, in the home. Then, since then, there have been other smaller bills. There was a tr transitional 
Infusion um, Act that was passed to help correct some things. So we're still working on that and we're in the process. It's pretty detailed. So if anybody is really curious, I could go into very specific information, but just know that we are still advocating for that. And a lot of steps are involved in the process and we have been achieving some of the steps. I did wanna answer it really quick though. I noticed that Rachel commented about um, how to get in contact to begin speaking with some medical professionals. One, reach out to Oli and let them know that you're interested. Sometimes opportunities come out and then Oli, if they know that you're interested, they can connect you with that. But then also, I was just, you know, I make the most of every opportunity. And during my medical appointment, I was just educating the doctor as usual. And he's like, wow, you sound so informative. And he recommended me for their, they actually have a program where with medical students where they have patients come in to educate the medical professionals. Um, so you can ask, now that that's at a teaching hospital. So if you, you can inquire with one of your doctors there to find out who to connect with to do that. Also um, in one of my slides, uh, hospitals have what's called a patient advisory council and they're looking for people to kind of give recommendations on how the hospital can proceed to improve patient care. And so that's something else to look into. And then also, um, I've just reached out to different organizations and once they know you're interested, then they've sent invitations then to, to give talks. Um, I've also gone to my local hospital and I've just walked into the administrative office and just started talking. And one last thing that I found, I know a lot of people who have had issues in the hospital with care. One thing that was really helpful for me over the years, the Ava posters for Save That Line and then the Oli posters as well. When I go in the hospital, I put those posters up and it's a polite reminder. It gives me a way to politely remind medical professionals, but then it's also educating them. And what was wonderful is the following year, the hospital actually signed up for that AVA program to reduce a hospital acquired infections and to, um, increase awareness within the hospital. So you never know how an action that you have, just putting a poster up and talking to a nurse can just evolve into more awareness. That's awesome. I love that so many of your interactions have come from these small things that we might not even think about uh, being catalysts for such larger change. Um, we are going to answer one more question, but I'm going to uh, excuse Lisa and Betty. They're going to go over to the other webinar where we're going to be doing the elevator pitch um, workshop and get that set up. Um, the link is in the chat. And uh, while they're doing that, I have one more question over for uh, Dale and Beth. Betty kind of touched on how to get involved. Sorry, what's up, Betty? I just wanted to say, um, if you're not sure what an elevator pitch is, say you happen to get in an elevator and the senator walks up next to you, what do you say? You only have a minute to give a little sentence to get your point across. So that's what we're gonna be working on is how to get your sentence very concise and to the point. See you Thanks, later, Betty. Thanks. sorry. Thanks, Betty. Good to see you. Thanks, Dale. Thanks, Beth. Um, so our, our last question, I'm trying to kind of combine, we've gotten a lot of questions. Betty touched on how to get involved with the medical professionals at your local hospital, but what are some other opportunities where you can speak to uh, manufacturers, the FDA, uh, medical students? Do you guys have suggestions on where you could start in your advocacy journey?
was was that uh, was that the question for me or Beth? Um, both of you can answer. Whoever has a suggestion. Okay. All right. Well, um, I, I would say you know since most of our work is uh, you know is is with the uh, federal legislators and uh, federal agencies, I would say that you know somehow you have to figure out a way to you know get affiliated with an organization um, that's you know that's doing something. And the Oli Foundation is a perfectly good example of that organization. And you know th by extension. Uh, participating in the activities of the DDNC, I think you'll find that uh, uh, you're emboldened uh, as an advocate if you are interacting with other people that have similar interests. And, um, you know, um, most organizations like the OE Foundation and the DDNC spend some time on trying to decide what they want. Um, and uh, so uh, we capture uh, the interests of the individuals and the organizations within our group and turn those into the types of things that Betty uh, referred to an elevator pitch. If you do see a senator, you're going to have to be able to say, here's who I am. Uh, this is why I'm here. This is what I want. And thank you. Uh, between the time the elevator door shuts and when it opens. Um, so you have to have a, that kind of a concise message. But you know, become involved in, in an organization that has advocacy as a priority, start to learn about the issues, um, and, but be, also be prepared to tell your story and uh, figure out ways to fit your story into those key advocacy issues that you're working on. And uh, uh, it's, it can be a little intimidating, um, but I think the more you do it, the more comfortable you're going to be doing it, and 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 the and the more opportunities you're going to get to express yourself and make a difference. And like I said, I'll I'll, I'll stop after this. Like I said, um, decision makers are hungry for good, solid information from people. That and there, there's no one with more of a pure self-interest than an individual that's suffering from some chronic healthcare condition or a digestive disease that goes to their decision maker, a legislator, a federal agency official and says, here's how I'm, I'm impacted and this is what I want you to, to do. You'll, I think you'll be astonished and surprised at the positive um, response you get. I know we're way over time. I'll take 30 seconds to say thank you, Dale, for saying that very articulately from a very specific perspective. And I can tell you from my perspective, I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, have a clear, concise message, which is going to come from your life experience because they can't, uh, like, this is the way it is. They really can't uh, refute that. Uh, do it clear and concise. Start little and work your way up. And even just my own experience was the local nurse saw my story with my son. We started talking. She's like, oh, you have a background in speaking. Hey, do you want to speak at the local such and such? Somebody said, hey, we want you to speak on the national such and such. While I was there, Joan Bishop, for example, saw me speaking, said, hey, we want to pull you into Oli. From there, it became, you know, so I even got to go talk at the NIH College of Medicine on behalf of all patients one time. Like, that's a little overwhelming. But you start with your clear, concise story and be willing to tell it anywhere, anytime with a positive message. It's not this desperate if you don't help me, we're going to, there has to be a positive of what we can do and then start little work your way up. That's how I'd say it. Thank you. So, so Crystal asked uh, the question uh, also, do we get mostly uh, representatives or senators? And I'm assuming Crystal, if you're still on the line, um, you're asking, you know, in our, in our congressional meetings, do we get mostly representatives and senators? You know, typically we get about 150 or so, 200 people registered for the public policy forum. And that typically means that we have maybe 30, 35 states covered. And each, uh, so we have 30 or 35 teams. Um, sometimes we combine the smaller states. Um, but if we have, say, for example, 20 teams, and each team is making uh, eight or 10 visits throughout the course of a week, um, you know, that's, uh, that's 
quite a few visits. So we cover a lot of ground with our representatives and senators. And a team will probably have throughout the course of the day or the week, eight or 10 meetings, uh, four or five with uh, members of the House and a couple three with members of the Senate. Well, I am gonna share my screen right now so everyone can see. Um, thank you everyone who um, participated today. And I just wanna direct everyone, Oli has some incredible resources on our website, um, on our awareness weeks for Feeding Tube Awareness Week, HPN Awareness Week on legislation and of course self-advocacy. Um, I also wanted to mention that Rare Giving and Every Life Foundation program has some great resources as well, um, including this advocacy one pager, which is incredible. So everyone can check those out there on our website as well. Um, and I really want to um, just thank everyone who participated today, Betty Marie Bond, Dale Dirks, Beth Gore, and of course, Nancy Pickett for moderating today. What an incredible job. We really, really appreciate you guys sharing your expertise with us and your experiences. Um, it, it's hugely important and impactful for um, our community. Um, I'd love to give a huge thank you to our sponsor, Every Life Foundation for Rare Disease, for making this educational program possible. And thank you to everyone who participated and uh, joined us today. We will post a recording of the presentation on our website in case you want to view it again. Um, and uh, uh, Nancy just added uh, the link to our advocacy workshop. So if anyone wants to join us in the advocacy workshop, please click on that link. Lisa and Betty are already over in that meeting and eager to get started. Otherwise, if you have other plans for the rest of the day, I'd just like to say thank you so much for joining us. Um, and have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>